So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you all very much for taking the time out here to attend today. As Scali was saying, this is Palliative Care Week, uh, and today we're talking about managing breathlessness in primary care. And just to, to liven it up a wee bit, I've put in a why, how, and who. Uh, throughout this week, we're keen to highlight palliative care and its importance, particularly uh, for myself as a GP, you know, the importance in community and primary care, uh, and about why it's important to do, to do it well, and so on. Uh, my name is Lars Dorman, I'm a GP in Kilkee, uh, it's in the east of the country here, and I'm delighted that we're actually hosting an all-Ireland educational session today here. It's aimed towards GPs, but it's very applicable for everybody, and so everybody's very, very welcome. The theme for Palliative Care Week this week is that we're in this together, and I feel that's very appropriate. Uh, and I'm very lucky in my practice because I have excellent teams who, who help me through my distance nursing teams, and also we're very lucky with the community respiratory team. And I'm delighted here to be joined today with Nicola Armstrong, who's a respiratory physiotherapy specialist, and Francis Campbell, a respiratory nurse specialist, uh, both from the Southern Trust. So thank you very much for both of them. Uh, I'll start off the talk here and they'll follow in uh, afterwards. So going to uh, talk a wee bit about why. So let's start off with a why. Sorry, that sounds like a very, very poor me. A why me, why I'm talking to you today about why I'm here and why I care about it. So I'm very lucky in that I'm a GP in Kilkee. So for those of you who don't know the geography of Port Kilkee, Kilkee is in the east of, of Northern Ireland. If you imagine where Newcastle is and goes south, and those walkers who know the mountains will know that it's sheltered in between the Mourne Mountains and the sea. And I literally have patients who through their back door can see the mountains and through their front door can see the sea. So it's a very beautiful part of the world. So I'm a GP principal there. I've been a GP principal there since 2007. Uh, but prior to that and during that, there was a good bit of overlap. I worked in, in Southern Area Hospice Services in Uri for 14 years, and it was a place I loved to work in. Uh, frequently just known as Uri Hospice to people who were from the area, but I was very lucky to be able to work as both a GP in Kilkeel and, and serve as a, as a hospice officer. So quite frequently I was able to admit my own patients directly into the hospice wards, which meant I was able to keep a really good continuity of care and explain to them about services that were coming and so on. So one of the experiences that I was quite struck by whenever I worked in hospice was, was anybody who works in a hospice will know that there's the inevitable fundraising um, expeditions that you go on. And so I would receive checks from all sorts of people around the country doing amazing things to help raise funds for their local service. And it was fascinating to be able to talk to people to hear about, about their experiences, but also to hear from both uh, patients and populations and professionals about what their impressions of palliative care and hospice services in particular were. And I was always struck about uh, the perceptions of people on a hospice service, about what they thought went on in a hospice. One of the most frequent questions that people would ask would be, is a hospice just a place to die? And of course, we would be able to reassure them saying, oh, no, because whenever I worked in hospice, about two thirds of our patients would be discharged. But also these myths sort of went through right through into general practice and to community care, about whenever you're dealing in palliative care, do, do healthcare professionals whisper when they're beside the bedside? And also the, the, the nearly outrageous where people had this image that anybody who performed palliative care had to have a sort of a Princess Diana complexion with, with perfect mascara while holding hands and so on. So I wanted to sell some of these myths and just explain why it's really, really important. Some of the medical uh, perceptions that I would hear from some of my colleagues actually varied from we must use very different drugs. And again, palliative care in the community must use very different drugs, uh, which we don't. We use very, very common drugs. And actually, my most commonly used books when I'm working in hospice was the DNF and also the Yellow Oxford Handbook of, of Clinical Medicine. But also people who think, oh, sure, we can just uh, throw in a lot more morphine and that, that will make life easier. And again, that couldn't be further from the, from the, from the truth. So quite keen just to, to raise some of these issues and show why this is important uh, and to dispel some of these myths because Palliative medicine, regardless of who you perform it, is all about uh, using your skills as a clinician and about using causation. And this is as important for breathlessness as it is for pain management and so on. So why do it well is a very important question. There was a landmark study in 2010 in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's well worth looking up by a colleague called Turnell et al, T-E-R-N-E-L. It was published on the 19th of August, 2010. Uh, the reference there is NEJM 2010-363 pages 733 to 742. And uh, what this found that if you did early intervention in palliative care, and this study is very relevant for today because it was done in metastatic non-small cell lung carcinoma, patients not only had a better quality of life, they also lived longer by approximately two months. And again, if we felt if we were a group of cardiologists here or endocrinologists talking about the latest drugs and we were talking about some intervention that made people live longer, we would all be, be very happy and we'll be congratulating each other about how important it was. It's really important that we realize that doing palliative care well, not only is it the right thing to do, 
but it is the right thing to do for patient survival and patient benefit. The outcomes are, are frequently better. So I think this is important to remember. Again, keeping on to the why. Why is such an important question? And as I alluded to earlier, good symptom control is the key to palliative medicine. And as GPs, you mean we all have medical degrees, and whenever I worked in hospice, our hospice patients were examined almost 365, you mean every day of the year. They, I physically had to bring them a stethoscope, listen to their chests every day, even when it seemed even a little bit mundane and routine. It was really important to always ask the question, why? Why is this patient breathless? And as we've all done our degrees, we go back to the basics. We go back to our history, our examination, and our investigation. Uh, quite frequently, we need to listen to people's chest. Could they have a pleural effusion? Uh, is there a metabolic cause? Do we need to send off somebody's calcium? Patients with, with lung cancer frequently can, can raise their calcium levels. So have we thought about these things? Could there be a superimposed infection? Could there be congestive cardiac failures? Uh, and it's unless we really get in and, and examine our patients frequently that, that we, we see these things. Uh, I remember quite clearly working in hospice one day, we had a patient transferred who was dying from uh, terminal leukemia. Uh, but whenever we, I examined him, he had putting edema up to his sacrum, he had uh, creps in both places, he had a raised JVP, and it turned out he had severe congestive cardiac failure. So his management was quite straightforward in terms of we had to drain him for fear with a lot of diuretics. He lost about four stone and he went home to live for a further eight months. Uh, so again, it was using clinical skills about, about using those to treat our causes of our symptoms. In Royal College of GPs, we see this quite frequently. So the Royal College of GPs runs a, a GP of the Year award every year. And frequently, whenever we hear this, we hear patient stories telling us about the importance and the value they have with palliative care and what it looks like to them whenever it's done right. I think we all know those clinicians, whether it's GP, nursing, physiotherapy, all of us know what this feels like when it's done right. It just is the right thing to do. It is the best thing to do. Uh, and we frequently hear our, our, our patients' personal stories. As I'm trying to give this as my, as from my experience as a GP, I feel frequently that the GP can act as an anchor in the community, an anchor as, as a healthcare team, uh, who, who's, and the trust and respect of our patients is vital because we know a lot of our patients, we know them right through, uh, we know their extended families and about how, how, that, how that affects those extended families. So I think that's just why, why it's so important that we in general practice to do this. So moving on a wee bit to the, to the how. So once we have, our, I mean, we've done our good history and examination, then we can start to think about why is this person breathless? And if we know why they're breathless, let, you know, then we can start working on to, to treating that breathlessness, which is a symptom. Uh, so malignant disease, okay, that's, it can frequently be malignant disease. Positioning is, is very important and, and the use of fans too. It's quite important. I see a lot of patients who actually, with terminal lung cancer, who actually prefer to sleep in their bed or in their chairs, uh, giving them a more upright position. Uh, and frequently as a GP, I'll say to patients in, in Northern Ireland, certainly we have a scheme where patients can be exempted for that. Uh, so frequently I'll write a letter and say, look, if your patient, if your, your mother or your father is more comfortable sleeping in a chair, certainly I'll do a quick letter here and that'll help get you to 20% off, which is always, always very welcome. Uh, same goes with a fan, and again, a lot of our patients are using fans with it, um, using opioids. So the big thing we find with opioids, and certainly when I've used them, is, is whenever to give these regularly. Uh, I, my pre preference is using Oromorph or a liquid-based opiate. Um, Serpidol only comes in uh, strengths of 10 milligrams. It can't go any lower. So if we want to titrate lower, we're frequently going to have to go lower with our, with our Oromorph dose, or we can use Oxidone in the liquid form. The really important thing is to start this and to use it as a regular treatment. So, for example, four times a day, 8 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 8 o'clock, and maybe another dose before bed, but being quite specific in our instructions with them, quite specific with the prescription for it, so the patients know exactly when to take it. Sedatives as well, like diazepam can work very well. The patients who are trying to have difficulty with swallowing, lorazepam works very well. And quite frequently, I'll use a one milligram tablet and tell them to break it in half to start with. Again, as we're going along, we're always prepared for and watching out for, for emergencies and, and breathlessness. So we're talking about lung cancer, so SVCs, superior vena cavity obstruction, uh, where patients present with an increasing in shortness of breath, where their face gets quite swollen and quite deep red, and their chest veins become quite prominent. Uh, if we have suspicions of this, it's very worthwhile phoning up our oncology colleagues. Uh, there's a good registrar on call service available in the Belfast Cancer Service. 
uh, and it's really important that we can discuss, you know, with the, the most practical uh, way forward with this. I've had a few patients with this quite frequently. I've had the patients I've seen with this have presented quite late in their life, uh, and so it hasn't been practical, you know, to transfer them. They've only been within days of life, so it's been more sort of an, an observational finding rather than something we need to act on quickly. If somebody does have it and you feel they would be suitable for transport and emergency radiotherapy and possibly stenting, uh, the treatment will be, you know, a high dose dexamethasone such as a 16 milligram stat dose and then followed up by an 8 milligram dose twice daily. Uh, always being careful for giving high doses of dexamethasone, not to be giving it after 2 o'clock because it can affect people's uh, sleeping pattern. Again, moving on, so we're moving on. Uh, so other emergencies there, hematemesis is a real risk. And again, the big way to treat hematemesis is to be able to try and predict it as best as we can. So we identify patients who we think could be at risk of it. So families are aware of it, are aware of what to do. And really, we need to be explicit with the family about having that challenging conversation. And say, look, if this happens, please have dark trials ready or some, something practical so they know exactly what to do. There's, there's, there's less of a panic with it. Moving on, so congestive cardiac failure is becoming more and more of a prominent feature. Uh, and we all know our treatment for congestive cardiac failure with ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, but all the evidence behind ACE inhibitors and beta blockers tends more for moderate and long-term survival. For treating symptoms of congestive cardiac failure, we need to focus more on things like loop diuretics, such as frusamide, uh, low doses of morphine and oxygen, uh, where our, our aim is to keep patients as comfortable as possible. And loop diuretics can be given subcutaneously. They can be given through a syringe driver as well, and I'll show you know, a, a link to a very good sheet about that in a wee minute. Um, so that's very important. And then pulmonary fibrosis and end-stage COPD, it's quite important to remember that a lot of these patients uh, can live for quite a long time. And I'm sure as GPs, we all know of patients who, who seem to have uh, su survived with these conditions for, for, for years in, in cases, uh, and then very suddenly the, their lives end uh, and, and nearly quite unexpectedly. So it's really important that we have good relationships with families we warn them that although they may seem stable, that their condition can deteriorate quite quickly. And again, using our advanced care planning, being quite explicit about that and about what, what to do if something suddenly does happen. Another way of, of, of the how, and one thing I'm quite in favour of, is, is called just-in-case boxes. Uh, I set these up quite frequently. Um, this example here gives you an example of, of the box. Quite frequently, I just ask patients to provide their own Tupperware or, or a lunchbox. Uh, but the important things are to remember is to, is to give the family a prescription for pain relief, for an anxiolytic, for, for a nausea, an anti-nausea agent, and something for secretions. Um, either I would use hyacinth hydrobromide or glycopuronium, which is slightly less sedating. But make sure it has a few small syringes and a small, few small needles. But also, most importantly, and again, I've fallen foul of this myself, is make sure that you have the, the prescription cardex written up. So you can see it there just on the right side as you're looking up it. That's the, you know, so that authorizes the, the attending nurse or our, our attending um, clinician authorization uh, to administer these and make sure then that our patient knows exactly where to contact. Uh, in our area in Kilkeel, we have a very good twilight nursing service. So it's really important that if our, our nursing colleagues are, are attending on the scene, that, that this is ready to go uh, and patients don't have to wait unnecessarily uh, for, for essential, essential medications. There's a very good article in the BJGP about this. I think it was in the last month, so again, it's, it's worth, worth looking up as well. When patients um, start to uh, come towards their end of life care and syringe drivers are, are erected, I mean, I, my personal preference is I like to do home visits for these patients on my way into surgery. I like to do it before starting surgery so that there's changes needed to syringe drivers and so on. I find it's just easier if that can be done uh, beforehand, so it means that we can discuss with our district nursing colleagues it means it's much easier to get those syringe drivers changed rather than myself doing the visit that we had at lunchtime. And then it comes down to about three o'clock when district nurses are trying to, trying to get these things set up. So it just gives us a wee bit more flexibility in the day. So this is just a, a list of, of useful resources I find. I think I find Macmillan has got an excellent website and lots of uh, resources for professionals and patients alike. It's really good. Uh, the link at the bottom is very good. So if you might want to Google it better. So the Regional Palliative Medicine Group in Northern Ireland if you look up on that, I've had to put it in as a bit because it's a very long link there, but they have an excellent sheet on heart failure uh, and it gives very good guidance about how to use syringe drivers and how to administer um, subcutaneous and, and IV furosemide in patients who, who, who've got terminal cardiac failure. Uh, it's, it's well worth uh, checking out. Uh, this, result, this slide is going to be available online 
afterwards here. So if anybody wants to watch this again, you know, it'll, it'll be available on there. So now we're on to the, the, the who again, and like we say, I mean, the theme of palliative care week is in this together, and, and I can't emphasize enough the importance of your entire team. Uh, so in my practice, we, we use the entire team, and when I say the entire team, I mean the importance of reception staff, the importance of our housekeeping staff, our district nurses, and our community nurse nurses. Uh, we're all in this together. In my practice, I use EMIS, which is one of the common uh, GP systems. And one of the good things I like about EMIS is that you can put on a thing called a major, a major patient alert. Whenever I put up a patient, if you imagine your computer screen that you're watching now, an alert can flash up on a box in front of it. So quite frequently, we will put an, an alert saying this patient is receiving palliative care. And what that does is that helps alert our reception staff just to ensure that they, that they give this patient and their family the Rolls Royce treatment. So if that patient is, is asking for prescriptions or something like that, they know that it's important and that, and that it needs to be acted on quickly. But this requires the entire team. Uh, having our entire team requires, you know, obviously good communication skills, and communication skills has to go both ways. So I, we make a real point in, in my practice to ensure that, that our colleagues have, have really good access to us. So I appreciate it's slightly different now with COVID, but, but the world of pre-COVID, you know, our district nurses would have been into our building frequently. They would have come and had a cup of tea with us to discuss cases. It's really important we make ourselves as GPs as available as possible to our colleagues. So that if there are issues that are arising from the community, we can all work together as one team. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to my colleagues here, to, to Nicola and Francis, uh, and they're going to keep me right here about, about when to change slides, because I'm realizing I've got all the power here for the PowerPoints. Uh, over to you later, Nicola. Nicola, you need to unmute. Yeah. Hey, there you go. Hi, everybody here okay? Yeah. Okay, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity um, to speak with you today on this very important topic of, of breathlessness and end of life. Um, and I'm joined with my colleague, um, Frances Campbell, the respiratory nurse um, in Uri and Moore. So the first slide, there are Lawrence on our community palliative um, respiratory patients. So the main patients that we would see on a daily basis is our chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, bronchiectasis and interstitial lung disease. And I suppose COPD has always been the mainstay of, of the patients that we would see. But over recent years, there, there's certainly a shift and there's more bronchiectasis coming through and also um, higher numbers of ILD coming through, whether that's to do with better diagnosis, but there certainly is, is a shift there. Um, all the above patients may have a, a primary um, diagnosis of one of these conditions, or they may have um, a mixed picture. And they could also have a possibility of a, a lung cancer on, on top of that. And the majority of them as well can have heart failure, which is commonly associated with chronic um, lung disease. Once the patient is referred to the community respiratory team in the Southern Trust, and we cover um, Nurian Morn, Armand and Gannon, and um, Craig Avonbaum Bridge area. Um, so once they are referred into the team, we, we will assist them through their journey from, from the day they are referred to us right to the end um, of their life. Um, we will accept referrals from, the, um, from both um, acute and secondary sources. And what's good about the team too is once the patients are known to us, they can self-refer themselves. So we always get positive feedback from that. Um, it's another support network from the, for them and, and they, they enjoy and, and they like to have, have us there if they need us. Um, as I say, once they are referred into our team, there's different strands within the team, um, which has grown from the team's infancy. And those include our normal long-term disease management, exacerbation management, 
Um, we carry out the Home Oxygen Service and Review Clinic, which is also known as HOSAR. And we also carry out pulmonary rehab classes, as well as um, nurse and physiotherapy-led clinics. So regardless of what strand of the service the patient um, enters, um, throughout those strands, they will be provided with the skills and the techniques um, to manage their change in breathlessness. So this is very much educated at the beginning and reinforced as their journey um, progresses on. So how do we assist with um, and care for them along this journey? Um, well, if you can move on to the next slide there, Lawrence. Okay. So we basically broke this down into three areas, um, non-pharmacological, pharmacological and, and social. So as we said um, on the previous slide, um, breathlessness is educated and reinforced throughout their journey. It just doesn't happen at the end of life. They're carrying these skills right through their journey. And as their breathlessness progresses, then other things are added in um, to help manage that. So one of the big things that we would use as physiotherapists um, to help with breathlessness management is breathing control and purse-lip breathing. Very simple technique, purse-lip breathing, where you're prolonging your breath out and really emptying the lungs and just allowing them for a nice breath in. And we do that to help just to, to control the breathing and get it back um, to normal diaphragmatic um, breathing as best they can. Um, positions of ease are also instrumental in breathlessness management and a lot of these patients will adopt these um, positions unknown to themselves. They're, they're maybe already doing it before we even come into play and they don't realise. But one of the common positions is forward leaning and high side lying or high lying. And in any of those positions, um, I'm kind of leaning slightly forward here at the minute with my, my elbows relaxed. Um, and basically, you're, you're, you're taking the pressure off the upper airways. You're trying to relax those and giving the diaphragm a wee bit more room um, to move. And again, along with your breathing techniques, that can help to alleviate the breathlessness. Simple pillow arrangements can also help with this, um, bringing pillows to the patient. And a lot of the patients towards the end of life, they can be, they can be very hyperinflated. And they're not maybe very comfortable going into too much forward leaning. So we can use the pillows and bring them, the pillows to them to make things more comfortable. Um, also, we would use a lot of um, Energy conservation as well plays a big part in, in their journey as well, so that they're planning their tasks, they're prioritizing what they, they need to do and their pace and activities. Because a lot of the time, the head wants to do what the body can't do and they have to slow things, um, slow things down along with their breathing. Okay? We, we try to promote independence for as long as possible and individual assessments are carried out in accordance with the disease progression and we would um, give out equipment as well that can help with um, their to help um, alleviate breathlessness and one of the simple things is a rollator. Um, again, because patients like the fact that they can use it to lean over, use it as a position of ease. And a lot of these patients, when you're talking to them, if they're out and about, they, they, they love pushing the, the trolley in the supermarket. Or if there's um, a child with them, they love pushing the pram because they're leaning over it. They're, they're adapting a, a position of ease there to help with their breathing. Um, 
In some other cases, whether it is shorter movements or longer movements, a wheelchair may be required, particularly with our fibrotic patients, towards the end of life, small movements, small activities, you know, it's like climbing Everest for them. So again, anything that can help just make things a bit easier for them. And we would also link in with our occupational therapy um, colleagues regarding other equipment, commodes and urinals. And we would also consider catheterization. Um, there, towards the end of life, um, toileting can create a lot of anxiety and a lot of worry um, for, for patients, particularly if they're starting to become um, incontinent. So those conversations um, do be had as well, and if they're agreeable, um, that um, conversation is then had with the GP, and that can be organised. And that does that is one thing from our experience that we know takes a lot of the anxiety off of the patient. We also encourage well ventilated rooms and fans that can assist the, the patient and also keeping um, just numbers to the room low and conversations as well because even basic conversations, particularly again for our fibrosis patients, can take a lot, a lot out of them. Um, and you'd be surprised, we had, we had one lady um, not so long ago and the simple movement of swiping the iPad you could see desaturation and her breathing and changing. So what we take for granted it really is crying in my devris for, for some of these patients. So pharmacological, I'm just touching on this. Lawrence has covered that very well. And you know, we're pr promoting that they're taking their medication as pres prescribed and they're taking it timely and regularly. And this is where we very much would be linking in with our GP colleagues and um, we would be exploring and having discussions about um, symptom management and what, what would be best placed for this patient. So there is a very much a two-way conversation goes on there um, between GPs and ourselves and, and that's vital um, to get it right for, for the patient. Um, we're also very proud that we have very strong links with our acute respiratory colleagues um, within Daisy Hill and Craigavon Area Hospital. And again, this has proved vital for, for seamless service and to ensure that the patient is getting um, the best care that they can. Um, so an example of that, if, if we needed to speak to them through, if they were coming to clinic or or we, we wanted to see what else we could add in here as well, there's conversations can, can be had there. Okay. We also have um, good relationships with our colleagues in palliative care and again if we felt their input um, was required we would pick up the phone to them and vice versa. Okay. So really I suppose early discussions with GPs um, around um, symptom management and end of life care is important and it really when when we work really well together you know that just works so well for the patient and you can see that um, coming through as well um, and then as I said medications you know that are instigated and they can be changed so those conversations are ha happening regularly and timely and as I said this can lead then just to a very comfortable um, patient journey and patient death. Um, as the patient is progressing towards end of life we touched on that basic functional tasks can become more difficult and we would offer care packages and if that is accepted then we would link in with our, our colleagues in, in the social worker team. And we very much emphasise the importance of time with um, care packages as well. 
because of the, their breathlessness, you know, they need that extra time, especially for, for recovery. So on to the next slide. Okay. Sorry, Nicola, sorry to interrupt you. Could you move your phone away from your microphone because it's causing distortion on the sound? Okay. Thanks. Okay. So um, oxygen therapy, okay. We've introduced this slide and whilst we know that um, oxygen therapy does not relieve breathlessness, it does play a vital role um, in end of life and a lot of our patients on, are on oxygen therapy. So it, it would have been remiss of us if, if we didn't, um, didn't speak about oxygen therapy. So um, I'm just touching on this. It, it could be a, a talk on its own. But basically, um, as I said, oxygen does not take away breathlessness, but it does play a vital role in, in a lot of our patients at end of life. Um, oxygen therapy can range from 0.5 to 15 litres um, in the community. This depends on the patient's condition and the requirements. And this is um, prescribed through um, the home oxygen ordering form known as the HOOF. Okay. And oxygen um, assessment um, plays a very important role um, in our team. Um, we carry out the long-term oxygen therapy and ambulatory therapy assessments within the clinic um, for the Newry and Warren area and the other teams carried out in Armand and Gannon and Craigavon Banbridge. With the oxygen prescription your risk and consent is also very important here and I suppose with end of life we are very mindful that patients abilities um, change and can change quite quickly and it's just being aware of that um, when we are doing the risk and consent and making sure that they will adhere um, to, to all those safety measures. The BOC provide the oxygen for the Southern Trust and at the moment it's 15 litres that they stand over in the community. Um, the majority of end-of-life patients who are receiving oxygen from our team can have it um, titrated accordingly. And when the oxygen is titrated according to their needs and assessment, each time that's done, the prescription has to be changed. So the prescription should really marry what the patient is receiving at home, and, th and that is important. There are different oxygen modalities out there for the patient. In terms of long-term oxygen therapy, you've got your standard concentrator and you also have a high flow concentrator. So your standard concentrator goes from 0 to 5 litres and there is a high flow concentrator that goes 0 to 10 litres. Um, and if they require higher than 10 litres, well, that would involve um, what we call daisy chaining um, concentrators together for that to be delivered. Um, a bit like um, Lawrence's just in case box, um, as, uh, as our experience has grown, especially with our fibrotic patients, their, um, their oxygen needs can change quickly. And, um, because of that, we preempt as well. And if we notice that things are changing and their demands are getting um, greater, um, we would preempt that with with their oxygen as well. Um, if the, the patient is still able to mobilize independently, there are a few options that they can use. They have the standard cylinders and lightweight cylinders, which all provide um, continuous oxygen and that is along with liquid oxygen and they have to be assessed separately for liquid oxygen. 
There are a few um, pulse modalities um, out there as well, and the most common one is the Inogen. And what I mean by pulsed is the patient is only receiving this on inspiration. Okay. And not all patients are, are suitable for this device. Um, so sometimes you'll get patients and they'll see other people with it and that they're wanting the same, but they have to be assessed um, for that. And I suppose if referring a patient again, it's it's just considering their, their resting sats as well, because if they're quite low, um, really is pulsed oxygen going to meet their demands when, when they're mobilizing? Um, so it's just considering that as well um, to, to avoid disappointment. There's different interfaces as well for delivery. The main ones that we would use is um, your nasal specs. You've got your standard nasal specs and high flow. Again, use quite a lot if they're um, on high flow oxygen and they have a slight curve in them and um, they, the, the curve goes down towards the nose um, into the lungs so don't turn it up the way because it then annoys the, the septum of the nose. Okay, Oxy masks are also used. They help to entrain more, more oxygen. The oxygen therapy is undisrupted and it reduces CO2 rebreathing because it's open and it can help aid communication and it's also accessible for care and reduces the feeling of, of claustrophobia. So patients may use it intermittently, might use it for a wee while because they feel they're getting a wee bit more oxygen from it, take it off and put the nasal specs back on. And again, that's very much down to, to the patient preference. So I'm going to move on now to my colleague Frances and she's going to, going to speak to you on anticipatory care planning. Hello. Preparation is key to ensure anticipatory care planning is carried out successfully. An anticipatory care plan is not written as you know in stone. It can be changed and updated at any time in response to changing circumstances. This would be discussed with the patient. End of life conversations are opportunistic and as a community team we have the luxury to have the time to recognise and exp explore patients' cues around this area. For example, a patient might say just nurse, oh, I think I'm done, or this ash is not helping me, or, you know, I'm still very breathless. And if we do have this conversation with the patient, we are able to link in with the GP and say, for example, this patient is on oxygen, he's still not getting any relief from it. The GP may, as Lauren said, introduce the the or morph, so that's the good link between us and, and the GPs. Um, we're also able to have the luxury to have the conversation with the patients um, if they have moved on to the palliative stage where they want to be cared for at home, if they want to go into the hospital or they prefer to be nursed in the hospice. Um, this gives um, the GPs the opportunity to discuss DNR and document patients' care plans in the out of hours and also with the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service. If this conversation in our experience um, are timely and if they're consistent and truthful, it builds up a trust which relieves stress and anxiety for the patients and their family around end of life and ultimately leads to a good and comfortable death. Um, an example which we can talk about um, recently in our team, we've had um, cared for a patient who a year and a half ago had a diagnosis of ILD which was um, picked up through a test x-ray in hospital. He hadn't had much contact with his GP because prior to that he'd been a relatively fit and healthy man. Um, this man was referred out to us by the hospital consultant for a review at our Hoser clinic that Nicola had discussed. He met the criteria for ambulatory oxygen. He was discharged home with, that, with ambulatory oxygen and all the relevant information along with that. As a community team, our role would be to review these patients at home who are on ambulatory oxygen. So, through regular reviews um, and the progression of his disease, unfortunately, he moved from ambulatory oxygen to long-term oxygen therapy. Um, through moving um, his oxygen therapy, we were able to have the conversations with him where he knew that it was because of his lung disease that he was breathless and that he needed more oxygen. 
So um, from the onset, he was aware of his lung condition. Um, unfortunately, this man's um, lung condition progressed quite rapidly. Uh, we were able to link in with the GP, who um, said that he would do <coughs> a home visit with him. He had a home visit with him, discussed medications, um, that, that was fine, and the patient was happy enough that he had the conversation um, with the GP. The family were very happy that they had the conversation as well. Um, at this stage, unfortunately, his oxygen therapy had moved up to 15 litres, which was the maximum therapy that um, he could be prescribed. He wasn't getting much relief from his oromorph either. He was still very breathless, very anxious, very distressed. Um, the GP had the conversation with him that unfortunately things have moved on to the end stage of his condition. The GP was therefore able to um, get the DNR form signed at home with the patient because the patient had relayed to the GP that he wanted to stay at home. Um, the family were happy that they had the open conversation with the GP um, and they knew that it was comfort. So the syringe driver was instigated then by the GP. So the district nurses were involved there also. We were also in review and monitor regular as supportive as well. Um, and that patient now was on the syringe driver for two or three weeks and he had a really good day at that home. His family were very happy with the care that he received. It was linked in with the GP. They knew whenever he passed away that not to die 999 to ring out of ours or um, <clears throat> to ring out of ours and that um, the needless thing of ringing 999, um, that they didn't have to do that. And they knew what to expect. And it was the, the they, were, they, they were happy that he was comfortable, that he was happy that all the support systems were there for him at home. And, you know, after he passed away, they did phone the office and they did thank us for bringing the GP on board for um, all our care and for giving them the information to know what to do when he did pass away. Because some people just don't know what to do. They know that the relatives are dying and they're just dying 999. Whereas they knew, you know, there was no point in dying 999 that, you know, between 9 to 5, GP could come out and certify him. So it, it was a success because it is important to have a good death. And he had a good death at home. So um, that's a typical example of some of the patients that we would look for at home. So um, you can move on to the next one, please, Lawrence. Okay. So in summary, this is a statement from a Dr. Robin Taylor, who is a consultant position in <coughs> the health service in Lanarkshire and in Scotland. And I attended a very good uh, conference with him in Scotland last year. And he's very much into end of life care. So um, what he says, we do much less planning for the end of someone's life than for the beginning. We prefer not to think about the end, but a human being's life is no less significant or important towards the end of life than at the beginning. In many ways, a person is more significant and important, their lives have been lived. So the planet should be just as good. So what we're talking about is open and honest communication and building up trust with the patient and, and, with, and with the family. That's it. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Nidla. Uh, we'll see if we can get the, the technology to work right here. So thanks very much, both Nicola and Francis there. I think that's really important. And like you say, I mean, it is a partnership, a team, not only between, you know, community teams and GPs, but also families as well. And I was always struck that you always need to bring your family with you when you're dealing with the patient. The family must be involved and part of that, that management process is really important. So I think we're open here to taking some questions. I think, Kathy, uh, Karen, um, there was a few questions down. So some people had submitted some questions uh, early on in, in the sessions, you know, uh, a couple of days beforehand. Uh, one of the questions actually was about, uh, about respiratory difficulties in pediatric patients who are end-of-life care and so on in, in communities. Uh, and I have to confess, you know, you know, Nic Nicola Francis and myself, we mostly deal with adults, so we don't know certainly uh, most of our, our cares with, with, with adults. Uh, but my experience is that, you know, the pediatric oncologists and, and the, the Royal uh, Belfast Hospital for Sick Children are usually excellent at, at having a really tight team. Uh, when it comes to it, they will involve the practice very, very well. But, you know, and as, as does the, the children's hospice stuff in Belfast as well there. Um, any other questions here? If anybody would like to submit a question here, if you want to type it into the into the chat function there, please. 
uh, and we'll do our very best here to, to, to answer any questions you have there. Uh, Lawrence, there was one question that came uh, in um, prior that was just asking about any non-pharmacological programs in the community that, ca that um, are you're able to refer patients into, although in fairness that is coming from someone um, from Cork, so slightly slightly further south. <laughs> it's, it's, it's slightly further south, but here, and, and, and a big hello to everybody in Cork, it's a beautiful part of the world. Uh, but so so it doesn't really matter. So again, the, the involvement is with the teams and so on. So even my first point of call will be to my respiratory team. There, there are also excellent uh, community interventions, and, and it's important to remember. And again, McMillan have been highlighting this that when a patient is diagnosed, there has to be a certain emphasis put on exercise and things like that that we sometimes forget about. That just because a patient gets a non incurable diagnosis doesn't mean that we have to abandon all the sensible things like like regular exercise and so on and although a patient mightn't be out doing, doing jogging and so on there's things that we can do with sort of uh, conditioning with respiratory that, that, that Nicola was mentioned earlier on so, so there are things that we can do right at the start and again back to the education uh, it's just really important that a patient knows what to do with the first lip breathing so on that, that they know exactly what to do when things get tight. Yeah I know from our point of view as Lauren said it's, it's very much education from the onset and, and reinforcing that so whatever strand of service they're coming through within the respiratory team we are constantly reinforcing the breathlessness management and assessing that and if if no if techniques are no longer enough for them and um, this is again where we would link in with our dp colleagues and um, for medication and um, advice and we'd also link in then with our our social our social team if we felt that they needed extra support socially. Um, in terms of respiratory, um, our plumbery rehab classes. Um, again, we very much promote exercise, and there's a lot of education from a multidisciplinary team there around the conditions and around managing them the best they can. They get peer support from that as well. Um, it's it, they were, are maybe not at the end of life stage, but it certainly gives them a lot of the tools and the yeah. skills to deal with with the management of breathlessness. And there's also a lot of voluntary sectors out there, yeah. and that is also good to link in with as well. Mm -hmm. Chest, heart, and stroke. And uh, I suppose now with COVID and all, um, access online. And um, to a lot of sessions as well, um, and you know, family will link in. You know, if they have a question, they'll phone in to us as well. So, yeah, it's education, reinforcement, encouragement, just throughout each stage. Yeah. yeah. And then one of the questions as well uh, that, that have been raised before was, how do we make palliative care a general conversation topic? Uh, is this with the patient? And again, I think that's really important that we as a society talk about it more. And we as a society recognise that advanced care planning is for everybody. We need yeah. anyway, we need to be talking to our families, whether we're sick or not, about what our wishes would be if something happened to us that that, that looked futile to, you know, that wouldn't be I mean, amenable to, to emergency care. So it's really important we have those. From a GP point of view, I think you know palliative care is really important that we get involved early. So as soon as a patient gets a diagnosis that you know, that we, we get involved early and that we have frequent reviews of those patients. Um, and again, it can be very challenging. I mean, I've had patients in my practice who've been on a palliative care list for 10 years. Uh, and it's not that that was a wrong diagnosis. It's just they could have died within a week. They could have died within a year. It, it just can be quite challenging. Uh, but it, the, the better your relation is, the more we view these people, the more we get to know them better, I think, the more that we can help them. Yeah. 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 Thank you summed that up very nicely there, no, Lars. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's important. It's all about being open and honest, yeah, and not being afraid of it, and not being afraid to talk about death. Some people don't want to talk about it. Yeah. So what is yeah. it? Is and, it? And, to and talking through what, things that could happen, so... Yeah, yeah. If this happens, you know, it's very easy, and it's no criticism to, to a patient, you know, it's very easy to panic. Feeling breathlessness is just the most horrible feeling in the world. So you really need to sit and talk through them, and, and particularly things like hemoptysis and so on that can be frightening, you know, sit them down yeah. and, and go through it point by point. Uh, if this happens, we should do this. If this happens, we should do this. 
because it's it's very easy to panic, you know, that if suddenly mum or dad gets breathless, people panic and, and dial 999. It's really like a clear yeah. instruction. Really we bad. get asked a lot to, um, when is this going to happen and, and how is this going to happen? And like our our answers are always like we we can't we we can't envisage when or how but obviously things can happen in different ways and remember um one gentleman not that long ago um we were called out the family had contacted us and he'd taken what they called a we turn um, the night before um, he was um, a fibrosis patient and he was very much in stage and um, it was going to the bathroom to you know the exertional activities and we went out and you know he was on assessment there was nothing different to to what it had been the week before but conversations were had you know like these wee events could be happening a wee bit more often and there is the possibility that daddy may not you know um, come round from one, one of these events and you know you could be here when that happened and they were like really and we were like well yes and but the other side of that you know your daddy could be in bed and just you know sleep away too and literally the next day a phone call came through that he had taken another return with the daughter and that is what's happened but she was glad that that conversation was had mm -hmm. because she was prepared for that you know she knew that this could 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 happen so um i think it's just you know having those and they, they very much knew that there had been a, a significant change in his condition and they knew that you know things were not were not good but you know we're looking for a very definite how and when and that's something that we we can't answer but sometimes you get the the, the way clues or, or the things aren't just going as as planned you know it was taken a lot out of them yeah and then you get the other end of it too where the family's trying to protect the patient the patient's trying to protect the family and nobody's talking <laughs> you know, so you can kind of get together and get them talking. You know, you know. Unfortunately, this is where things this is where things have moved on to. You have to um, be the negotiator. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're, you're really true. Yeah. And after negotiating, I mean, you can see the weight of the patient's mind, and you can see the weight of the, of the relatives. And you know, that that does lead to a peaceful death, most definitely. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. They're, Communication. They're on the same page, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. you know, they're saying what we're saying, and. Often to you know sometimes like I suppose again with experience from 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 dealing with these patients and having these conversations that would have been alien to me you know thirteen years ago but now you know we're in the post and mm -hmm. you're developing skills and you know right. you, Francis says you're looking for opportunities and then and they're 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 usually there in some form whether it's verbal or non-verbal like um oh i'm done and you know well what makes you say that and then just that opens a conversation or you know what do you think's happening here and you know if they're on the same page they're quite they usually open up quite freely um and on some occasions you're not they're not giving you anything back and and you know it mightn't be the right time to to mm -hmm. um progress for that conversation so you know it is about um, of timing and I suppose we're lucky in the job that we are we we have a bit of more luxury with time in, in, in the community so uh, and I think that's important then that we, we're feeding back all the time to to yourselves um, are there any more ca uh, questions in there Kathy? No, I'm quite conscious of time. We're a bit over. Okay, so thank you everybody for for attending today. I really appreciate it. I mean, everybody's got busy jobs. I really appreciate you all for, for participating. I'm very happy to be contacted through the college website. If you check in RCGP and I, you can see there's an NI chair email. I'm very happy if people want to follow this up. I'm more than happy or, or direct message me through Twitter.